What is the most interesting thing that you recently learned that surprised you? It was the most custom written proposal I'd ever done in my life. What's the journey after that? If my business were to shut down or fail, I'd go to culinary school. Like, What are three resources that you'd recommend to folks starting out their business, freelance, mm -hmm. their journey? Miro's whiteboarding, so we use that with every client. Where do you draw the line of, it's your job to go tell them something's wrong and needs to be fixed? The whole point of entrepreneurship is to evolve and grow and change. Hey guys, welcome back to Funds and Founders. Today we have on Sarah. Sarah were, had various roles at Skillpoint Austin, which is a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. You were the CEO and chief designer at 99 and St. Clair. Mm -hmm. And then most recently you founded Systems, mm -hmm. and we'll put up a link, where you call yourself chief digital architect. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I feel like such a celebrity right now. This is so fun. <laughs> Before we start, we know that retention on YouTube's four or five minutes. So what do you want to plug? Where should people Ooh. learn more and reach out? Yeah. So I'm the Sarah Loretta on literally everything. Sarah, no H. Uh, I'm very, very particular about not having an H on my name. Um, but yeah, you can literally find me. Twitter is where I hang out. LinkedIn more so now than ever, I feel like, in the last couple of months. And then on YouTube. Okay. And we'll link everything. But I, I'm switching things up to... Show people in the beginning, not the end. So. Sure. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Sweet. One thing I like starting with is understanding where do you think your entrepreneurial journey started? At what point in life did? Yeah. So it's so funny because I really never knew entrepreneurship was real. I know that that sounds so silly, but like when I thought of an entrepreneur, I thought of Steve Jobs, right? Like you had to create something so drastically life-changing and impactful. But I actually was an entrepreneur when I was like nine years old. Um, so I grew up in East Cleveland, very proud 440. And uh, I used, I, our neighborhood was all like 80 year old people, right? Like we were the youngest family on the street. And so at nine years old, I was mowing lawns and weeding and like laying mulch. Um, and then one summer, my dad and I delivered phone books. So that was like, I have like vivid memories of us in our minivan illegally driving down the street with the van door open and just like throwing phone books on driveways. Um, so there was that. And then that was kind of it. That was like a kid summer job, right? Yeah. Um, what did you get paid for it? Oh, God. I don't even remember. I mean, honestly, so we had this neighbor, Anna, who, rest in peace, she was one of my favorite humans. She was like 86 years old when I was in fourth grade. Little old Polish lady, right? And she would wake up every morning at 3 a.m. during Lent and like make massive bags of pierogies and just feed me. Like she was my babysitter, you know? So I feel like she probably just fed me in good food, right? And it was just like nice, good, yeah. good transaction. Um, but yeah, and then, you know, I got into a nonprofit. I did AmeriCorps. That's how I moved to Austin at 18. And um, I, uh, you know, then I ended up being at Skill Point for, God, seven, eight years and couldn't find another job. I was interviewing, interviewing, interviewing. And every tech company was like, you wear too many hats. You're going to be bored. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm 25 and I'm tired. <laughs> like, I want to be bored. And um, and then, yeah, literally, I just started reaching out to every partner. And I was like, hey, you don't have a me on your team. Like, I was so mad that I couldn't get hired somewhere else. And there was just a lot going on in that environment. You know, it was my first, quote unquote, like, real job. Like, I kind of, like, couldn't move around. But also, like, there was zero professional development. And so I definitely feel like the environment forced me to make my own path because it didn't set me up for success somewhere else. And um, so, yeah, so I literally went to every partner of Skill Point. I was like, you don't have a me on your team. And I landed 40 clients in my first six months. And then I was like, oh, I guess I'm doing this. And I quit. Like, literally, I think I, it was like two days before my 27th birthday and been rocking and rolling ever since. I don't know, it's weird. It's like, I didn't, like people ask me all the time, I'm like, I didn't choose this. Like I started a business, I didn't have a website, didn't have an email, like didn't get an LLC my first two years. Like I didn't know anything. I just was like living on vibes and caffeine, you know? <laughs> just getting shit done. And I guess it worked, I don't know. But I think that's probably what makes an entrepreneur is just doing it and not really thinking about like, the super finite details to make it actually happen, you know? Yeah. yeah. So when you started, you said you landed 40 clients mm -hmm. in six months, right? Talk through a little bit of like how that ended up happening. Mm -hmm. And for someone who doesn't know 
what does that mean? Like contracts, sure. invoices, payments. <laughs> when you do Stripe, you pay three and a half percent, which on smaller bill ends up adding up when it you're doing up. a lot of different payments, right? So yeah. just talk through that from start. Yeah, so I think context is important. So for those who have never worked in the nonprofit space, um, you don't just do your job. Um, and so I I literally had two full-time careers when I was at Skill Point. So I got hired as a data assistant, I learned how to build SQL. We we built the compliance department. Like for a twenty year organization, that did not exist. Like we were surviving out of filing cabinets. Like it was a shit show. Um, and then around, I probably was there a year and a half, maybe two years. We lost a massive grant with the state, and we went from a team of sixty five to a team of sixteen in about eight months, which is insane. I mean, we were cutting programming left and right. Directors were leaving. And one day our executive director looked at me and she goes, you're young. You understand social media. Now, mind you, I was I was younger than everyone else by about a seven year gap. I literally started there when I was 18. And so uh, I was like, I don't know what any of this means. And so in an instant, I took over website management. I took over PR. I took over communications, took over our social media. I had zero experience, like zero. And I championed it. I was like, okay, well clearly they see something in me, right? Like I'm somewhat outgoing, I guess. Like, And so I dove head into telling stories and learning video. And I ended up launching a, I guess you call it a campaign about women in construction. Cause for those who haven't heard of Skill Point Alliance, um, we do adult workforce programming. So pre-apprenticeship, plumbing, electrical, machine operator, um, HVAC, all those good things. And we kept having women come through the program and it's like, whoa, like I didn't realize women did blue collar, right? Like and it's not that I was being naive, but you just don't normally see it. Yeah. You see it more now in Austin. But so anyway, so there was this woman that came through the program named Lalisha. Never forget her till the day I die. She had had a set of twins, had one other child and was pregnant with twins living in her car. She showed up every single day on time to her plumbing class, graduated at the top, was hired within days of graduating from us. And I was like, that's the story people need to hear. Like, you know, I come from a pretty tough background no one ever wanted to tell my story, you know? So it's like, if I have the opportunity to tell somebody else's, like, let's let's go, you know? And so I kind of let that champion the work that I was getting hired to do on the side. So um, my first client was the um, non-electric union, which we shared a building with, literally across the street from where we're filming this right now. And they do a statewide barbecue competition every year. And they go, do you want to come film a barbecue competition? I'm like, hell yeah, like, let's go, right? It was like the most weird request, right? And I had a blast. And then because we also do union, then I got in with the union and I did all of their training videos for all new students to get into the, their um journeyman program I was doing video for plumbing board I was like it was like you were doing video production editing yeah. like the yeah end so to I end. was like interviewing students I was Got interviewing um, teachers and directors to like basically sell people to join the union which yeah. is like wild to think about right um and then i got into filming uh the statewide electrical competition so i was like traveling and going and filming these dudes just like wiring crazy circuits like weird weird um and then i got into facebook and the austin freelance gigs facebook group really set the stage for me because i was like oh yeah like i do know how to do wordpress i know how to do this like oh this person's asking for help on a wix site like why can't I do that? And I feel like that set the momentum to just be like, I can Google anything. Like, I'm just going to say, hey, I'm available. And that just literally spiraled. Um, but I've been 100% referral for six years now. Like, I haven't, I don't know how to market. I don't know what it means to, like, send a cold email. Or, like, I mean, you and I have talked about, like, yeah. how do I market on LinkedIn? Like, I don't know. Like, vibes. I, I literally <laughs> don't know. <laughs> you so, know? So, yeah. How did you decide what to start helping people out with. So like you mentioned you were doing a bunch of video and mm -hmm. production and film. Mm -hmm. How do you go from that to, oh, let me help this person with a WordPress Wix website? Was yeah. it was it a conscious decision or was it more like, oh, let me just see if I can make some money on the side and help these people out? Yeah, or? it was literally at that point, um, I had played around, like I'd started YouTube because, you know, 
no one was really talking about AmeriCorps at that point. And I was the first person to get on YouTube that was non-government media talking about the program. And so I would kind of started a blog. I'd kind of done other things. And so when I had seen those posts, I was like, I can update an image for you. Like, why would you pace? Like, I think a l I look back at a lot of the things I've gotten paid for and I'm like, you could have just done it yourself. Like, I'll take your money. But that really, I think, then set the tone for how I would be with my clients of really empowering them to know what to do and not have to pay me unless they don't have the capacity, right? Um, because so many projects were like, okay, we'll do this. That's fine. Like, pay me 250 bucks to, like, edit some copy on your site. Like, I don't know why you can't do this yourself, but I digress. Um, but yeah, it was literally just like, I would literally sit on Facebook and just join all these groups. And literally I made it a point to be always the first two comments because I always know, like if you've ever commented on someone hiring, you know that they don't look past like the first three people um, unless it really doesn't work out, right? And I don't want, I never wanted to be a sea of like, I can help, I can help, I'm available. Like that just sounds... I don't want to say desperate, but like, I just think it's it's noise at that point, right? Obviously. And so I was literally just on it every day, all day. Um, and then, yeah, I think I probably did that for like four months. And then my first big project, it's so funny because I quit my full-time job in like October 1st of 2019. And then Christmas hit. And I didn't understand that for freelancers, like the holidays are the slow. Like I did not plan to quit, but I was like, I am not turning 26 at this place. And um, so I started driving Uber and I won my first design client from somebody in the back of my car. Nice. Like, <laughs> like first like official full build. Like I was literally driving someone to the airport and I had business cards in my glove box. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm just starting out freelancing. Like this is what I do. And the guy was like, oh, we need a website. I was like, okay, well here's my card. As he's like getting out to go on a plane and he ended up following up and that was my first web design How client. big was that client? I think I charged like $1,800. Like okay. it was like, uh, what did they do? They they were like a therapist or some like some kind of counselor, you know, not like a HIPAA violation therapist, but like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Basically just like consulting, you know, in a way um, I charged 1800 bucks and it, I was like, oh, this is so much money because it was literally what I got in one check from skill point. Like I literally never made more than three grand a month from there. And I worked there for eight years. Like I was like this is wild. And that was like a high that I was like, oh, I'm never going back to a real job. So at the point of when you quit your job, did you already have money coming in from no. freelance gigs or? Yeah, but it wasn't consistent, no. you know? So I feel like back then, one, I didn't know what to charge. So I was like, oh, well, I make $28 an hour. Like, I guess bucks. I'll charge $28 an hour, you know? Um, I really had no concept of financial structure. And so my whole goal was to just make what I was making in my day job. Nice. But then at the same time, I was like, I can always Uber. I can always Instacart. Like I was so miserable by the time I left Skill Point that I was like, I will do anything. I don't care. Um, and I like looked for a couple other jobs in my first like year, but it was just literally smooth sailing and then COVID hit and half of my clients didn't need to be on the internet before COVID and then COVID hit and it was like, oh, everyone needs a website. Everybody needs this, this, this and it, and I haven't stopped since. Nice. So, yeah. The reason I ask is a lot of people have a lot of different opinions on advice here of like yeah. build up your side gig to X before mm -hmm. quitting or do it on the side and then... Mm -hmm. Um, wh where do you think you land on that camp of like, should you go all in? Should you build it on the side? Should you figure out a good balance or what's your recommendation for someone starting out? I don't recommend people have trauma. Um, I will say for me, you know, if, for those listening that don't know me, um, uh, I was a runaway at 15. Nothing scares me anymore. Like there's very few decisions in life that are permanent, like murder, right? I'm never going to go do murder, but like, that's a pretty permanent decision. And so I knew taking a leap, like I could always go do something else. So for me, it was at that time, I was literally leaving work crying every day. My Jesse, we, we had been together, I think two years at that point. So we've been together six now. Yeah, so maybe we were together like a year and a half and we were fighting all the time because I was so miserable from work. 
And I was like, I value this more than a day job. Like, let's figure this out. And so, you know, I think for me, I also don't have a lot of finances. Like, I'm not a huge spender. I don't sit here and purchase things and have extravagant things. Like, I've always been a very... Like I was raised in a household to feel guilty for spending $20 on a t-shirt. Like that's just how I was raised. And so I wasn't that concerned about like fulfilling a six figure corporate salary. Um, I I wasn't honestly even that afraid of losing healthcare. Like I was like, Obamacare, okay. I don't understand. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't that nervous. Um, but I think for other people, everybody's situation's different. Makes sense. And I think that the biggest thing you have to get over is like taking the, f the fear out of the leap and then the rest falls into place. Um, and so if you have a lot of expenses, maybe think about how do you cut back yeah, and like, like what's that. not necessary. Um, but then I think the other thing is like, what do you really want to do? What do you want to do? But also, what are you, what work are you willing to put in? And I guess this can be my spicy take of the episode. But I think that a lot of freelancers have gotten lazy over the years and just kind of think like, oh, if my website's perfect, like shit's just going to come to me. And that's like not reality. Um, I think there's a lot of really bad narrative out there, too. That's like only work four hours a week, like or four hours a day. Like you don't have to hustle. And it's like, no, no, no. Like you guys don't understand like a year ago I was pulling all nighters at least once a week. Like it, you have to do yeah, the work, yeah. you know what I mean? But I think the other thing is like, you're not going to make six figures your first year. 100%. You're not, and maybe not your second year, maybe not your third year. So what number are you okay with and call it on that work towards that. And then anything else is like girl math. It's free money, you know? <laughs> It's free money. <laughs> the reason I ask is I feel like a lot of people like the idea and they hear the stories on, look at this 26 year old who's doing a million a year with his mm -hmm. productized service agency. Mm. Oof. I'm Ooh, like, <laughs> um, and I mean, that's fine. There may yeah. be a one in a million that are actually doing that. But there's so many that aren't. Mm -hmm. And I think what some people fundamentally get wrong about this equation is Everyone has some edge they're leveraging, mm -hmm. whether it's distribution, whether it's mm -hmm. experience, connections, network. Mm -hmm. um, I run my own software agency, and I know folks who have been doing it for 20 years, mm -hmm. but they have a shitty website, and they have shitty deliverables, mm -hmm. but they just know everyone. Yeah. And because they do, they, they do and well. that, that exists, and that's fine, right? And that's something I'm not going to be like, hey, why are you doing it? I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And I think people get that. Or assume so many things that like oh he did it i can do it too i'm like mm -hmm. i don't think so it's yeah. i mean if you're if you don't understand the full facet of mm -hmm. building a company mm -hmm. very hard and when you run an agency even if you have employees at the core of it you're always responsible yeah. so if someone shits the fan mm -hmm. you have to go figure you can't be like hey my employee quit right. like that's not the client's problem it's your problem right. right well i think the other piece of that is that so many freelancers think they have all the answers yeah. they're like i'm gonna niche this way i'm gonna do that and it's like no honey like that's not reality you know like so many people are like well what's your niche i'm like b2b and they're like but what's your niche and i'm like b2b like i don't niche down outside of that because if i did we would not be sitting here right now like i would not have the clientele that i've had i would not have the success that i've had because I never once sat here and pretended like I knew everything. I take every single client as like, ooh, what's new? What am I learning? What do I hate? What it, what's the experience here that can move me forward? And I think that's the key, is figuring out what your long game is, not what your end game is, yeah. and calling it from there. You know? Makes sense. So you land the $1,800 client. Mm -hmm. What's the journey after that? What are the steps? How do you how do you take the money, the invoice? Sure. How do you figure out what you need to do? Okay, so when I first started, I used Square, which I was like sending invoices through Square, which I think is fine. Like Square was fine. Um, it, I didn't have any issues. I never had a contract. I didn't have an LLC until I literally said, okay, I'm gonna do this for a year. And if that works, because filing $400 for an LLC was like a lot of money to me back then. And so I was like, I'm gonna do this for a year. If it works out, then I'll file, right? Um, it took me, I think, like 
going full time before I had my first contract. Like I think I did my first six months without any kind of commitment. Like I was like payments contract, right? Like I'm a trustworthy person. That's not reality. Like you need a contract. Um, and so <clears throat> I quickly fell into processes and learning like, okay, knowing what I learned from skill point and like how bad our contracts were and like how much money we owed to the city and just different things. When we started, I was like, I never want to be in that place. Right. Um, and so I slowly started implementing. Um, and then I found FreshBooks pretty early on. And so I was a really heavy FreshBooks user. I was like, cool, I can do payment plans. I can do, you know, I never have charged hourly. I always would invoice a full amount, right? Like even if I was like, oh, I'm charging $30 an hour. I was like, well, your invoice is 250, right? Like I wasn't, I was never letting someone see that calculation. Um, and I used FreshBooks for a long time until I went quote unquote productized about a year and a half ago. And now I just invoice through Stripe and it works. Um, and I have universal contracts, so I don't custom write per, um, SOWs unless it requires it. So I've had a couple clients that you know, like nine month ish contracts, a lot of red tape that needs to be covered. Um, but other than that, I use Universal and nice. no one seems to have an issue with it, which is nice because I automatically include NDA, I automatically include liability. I automatically include, you know, I'm allowed to share your project out, you know, different things like yeah. that. And they've been fine. I think it's when people are weird about redlining there, I think it's they just want to feel like they're doing the best they know how to mm -hmm. to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you, especially if there's no lawyer involved, yeah. it's just someone like. Well, what if something happens? Mm -hmm. Am I protected? It's mm -hmm. just that feeling of, oh, like I've done my right. part, right? Uh, more than anything. You should so. always pre-protect yourself. And it doesn't make you an asshole. It doesn't make you come across and like you just, so a great example, we can talk about it. I don't care. Um, I got sued once and threatened to be sued another time. Um, the first time I did not have my LLC yet. It was right around the, the first winter storm. And Jesse, my partner, he's a plumber. You know, he was in and out of houses for 16 hours a day. I, I swear to God I had COVID. It wasn't real yet, but I swear to God I had COVID. And <clears throat> was super sick, canceled a client meeting. But I was like, look, like I'm gonna send you all the deliverables, but I just like, I literally have 104 degree fever. Not even 24 hours later, I get legal notice from their team demanding a full refund that I didn't give the deliverables as promised. And it's like, bro, I canceled a meeting. Like, you still got all your deliverables, but I digress. But what prompted me to get an LLC, and I tell this story for anyone who doesn't have one yet, um, is they illegally pulled my credit report. And back in 2017, I had my name changed, and it's court sealed. You can't access it, but my... Um, Social security number shows my birth name and my current name, right? And uh, yeah, and they pulled my credit report illegally and said that I was lying about who I was, that I was just like stealing their money. I was like, I didn't realize people were horrible. You know, like I just had been go like I had yeah, been yeah. freelancing for a little over a year at that point, like a year and a half, two years. And I was like, I never encountered this. Like, what is going on? And at that point, I was like, nope never, never operating as myself. Like I'm getting that LLC because they could have literally, not that I have a lot, but like they could have taken everything from me, you know, over what you just didn't want to pay for the work. Like you went through that much headache just to not do the work. So I ended up giving them a refund. They still did a chargeback. So American Express took 20 grand out of my bank account that didn't exist there. And you know, I'm a new freelancer. I didn't have money. And I was like, and luckily I won that American Express side with me. Like I am an over documenter. That's the other side of my career with skill point, like data and compliance. There is nothing that is undotted, uncrossed. Like I am to the T and that has saved my ass. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that was wild. But now, you know, for me, it's like, I don't give a fuck. Like I am covering my butt. I do not care. Like everything is written down and my entire contract is literally built because of bad situations. And it's like, if this makes you feel uncomfortable, that's on you. But I am not a part of your company. I'm not an employee. I have to protect myself at the end of the day. And yeah. that's it, you know? So crazy, crazy times. Oh my God. I can't I, believe I lived through that. <laughs> I think, I think that's something that again, 
people coming to this don't understand the depth of what can happen, what can't happen, right? Mm -hmm. I think there's probably like 10, 12 grand of unpaid invoices people still owe me. Oh, yeah. I don't think I'm ever getting it. Yeah. But there's... N Unless I want to be a bitch about it, there's right. probably not I mean, much I mean, you could take it to small claims, but it's like... At that point, I'd rather put that amount of effort yeah. in signing a bigger client yeah. in the, instead of exactly. like, hey, just go pay this small invoice. Oh, I have right. a $600 invoice that's been sitting unpaid, I think, for like three months now. And it, I don't even care about the $600. I mean, I do, but I'm also like, it's the basic respect that you went through all this just to what? Like, not pay... It's not like it's like 15 grand. Like... It's six hundred dollars. Yeah, and it's just the it's just the basic respect that I think a lot of people lost during COVID. I yeah. really do. I agree. Yeah. So you start the LLC, mm -hmm. you're signing clients. What was your first year like? How many clients, total revenue, and what did that do for you in terms of figuring out how the next year or two went? Oh God. Wow, I'm like really digging in my memory now. I'm like, I think ballpark's I did, fine too. Ballpark's fine too. Yeah, just an I idea. think I did like 53 or 55 my first year, and mind you, my skill point salary was forty thousand pre-tax. Okay, um, I thought I was living the dream. I was like, I am so rich. Oh my god, I'm making more than fifty grand. And then I was like, oh shit, I have to pay taxes, right? Um, so that was the first year, and. It was really up and down because I still didn't understand my pricing. Um, but I I had started to learn, okay, I need $500 for my car payment. I need $150 for insurance. My rent is $1,100, right? Like, how do I get that money and what do I do? Um, and my first year, I was literally fortunate because I left Scale Point October 1. It was Christmas and then COVID hit in March. So it really wasn't like a high swing at the start, but literally the second COVID hit, every nonprofit was hitting me up and being like, we need a website. I worked really closely with the San Antonio Holocaust Museum, which was a dream for me because I went to school for history and public history specifically. And I was like, oh, this is the dream. And so I literally put all of their curriculum online because they had to shut down for COVID. Um, I was getting, I mean, I was getting cool projects left and right. And then um, I landed a client, which was my first nonprofit impact brand. And I was like, oh, this is what I want to be doing. And it was a woman out of um, Broward County, Miami, who had it was actually a CPG brand, too. It was my first like really well paid job. And it was CPG brand. And she Valerie, her name's Valerie. She had created biodegradable, organic hygiene products so tampons pads but she also she was going through this incubator and patented a 3d printed um, dispenser and was landing contracts in school districts to give hygiene products away for free and her brand was like atrocious like very old school like feminine hygiene and she came to me and she's like i love your style like it's bold i really want something that speaks to us and I kid you not, that is still one of my favorite projects I've ever done. We did, I did all of her packaging. We designed, I mean, social campaigns. We designed, I mean, like literally anything you could think of, I did for this girl. Cause I was like, I believe in what you're doing so heavily. And that really, I feel like took my portfolio to nice. the next level. But she was also the first client that made me realize, oh, that other career had skill point. I didn't know I could freelance and do it. And so she was one of the first people where I was like, we need to set your processes. We need to set your pricing. Um, and she unfortunately shut down within a year of working with me. And that started to be a reoccurring theme where I was like, ooh, everyone says like, don't do scope creep. But like, I know you're not going to be successful because you can't answer these simple questions about your business. And so I started bringing that other career back into the swing and that's when I started to shift back into biz dev nice. and ops nice. um and I realized you know like I love design and I'm really good at it you know I don't think I'm good at a lot but design I'm really good at and um but it was one of those things where it's like I would rather you be successful long term than us just make a really pretty logo yeah you know like we can do the logo but like the, we got to do the foundation first uh 
And yeah, and it kind of just like all fell into place. So I was living both lives again very quickly, right? It was like, oh, okay, I have two careers again, but I'm only charging for one of them. Um, and then I found Notion and that's the what I think year three. So yeah. Nice. Yeah. So when, when you're working with a client like that, mm -hmm. as a consultant freelancer, do you... Where do you draw the line of it's your job to go tell them something's wrong and needs to be fixed mm -hmm. or hey my scope of work is X let me just do mm -hmm. this. How do you figure out where you lie because I think mm -hmm. that's also a problem a lot of folks face, face is mm -hmm. you're bringing me in for X. Mm -hmm. I see that there's something there I need to do. Mm -hmm. Should I say something? Should I not say something? Is it my job to do it or not? Yeah. Where, where, where do you land in that? So it's interesting because I got into this on Twitter the other day, X, sorry, got into it on X, um, is that one of my qualifiers for clients is, are you going to collaborate with me, right? Like if you are just going to hire me for the job and not talk to me, not engage with me and it, just expect me to do it, then I'm just gonna do what I was paid for. But if you are willing to have conversations and you're respectful and you're engaging, there's no such thing as scope creep. I really believe that. Because, and, th and this is how, you know, why I charge flat right now too, because it allows us to have open dialogue without the fear of like, oh my God, is she going to charge me more? Am I going to get a surprise invoice? Like, no, if we sit and have a conversation, you're like, oh, I didn't know that I could track my KPIs or I didn't know that like, you know, I needed a calendar booking tool. I don't know. I'm just throwing random yeah, yeah, yeah. things out there. Like, you should not be fearful to ask me those questions because if you are, then I'm not doing my job, Right. And I always did that when I had my design business and now back in, in ops. Um, like, if it's not ruining my time or taking away from something else, like, I am so happy to do it because it's only going to give you more value at the end of the day. But I think if that basic respect isn't there, who cares? Don't do it. You know, I think you have to, like, know your gut. And I think that only comes from experience. So. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so talking about the journey from design to biz ops, mm -hmm. you rebranded from 99 and St. Clair mm -hmm. to system underscore systems. Yeah. With a trademark. <laughs> a couple questions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, why the rebrand? Yeah. Um, so, so funny. So 99 and St. Clair for those who are not from Ohio and not from Cleveland, that is actually an intersection in East Cleveland that was made popular by the hip hop group bone thugs and harmony I'm a huge bone thugs fan um and so i was like oh cleveland like i've got to, i've got to talk to my roots right and like that's still my llc i didn't change my llc okay. but i felt like in that rebrand you know i'm kind of known as the pivot queen now we can talk about that too later but when i moved into biz ops and i got really into notion and was doing not design people were still coming to me for design, even though my website said nothing about design. It had been completely rebranded. And I was like, if I'm going to be successful in this new era, I have to walk away from it. Um, and that was just a conscious decision. You know, I wanted also my business name to not be, people are gonna hate me for saying this, but like, I felt like it was very like girly branded, like the name, like even though it's like, hardcore like east cleveland like i still felt like it it just felt very feminine business okay. whereas systems sounds tech it, it. sounds forward thinking it's simple it rolls off the tongue um and so yeah that was a big a big change in reason mm -hmm. why the trademark yeah so it's so funny because like i just think the underscore looks cute as the logo um but there is another company in the, in europe that is called system without an e which drives me insane because they filed their trademark doing what i do but their website is nowhere near doing what i do so Really, the trademark was just to get ahead of, um, you know, people stealing what I do, because I've also had people steal my stuff before, you know, so it's like, let's just have all the legal everything. Okay. So, yeah, but it's still pending. Um, as anyone will know, the trademark office is like a year plus behind. Um, so the TM will stay for who knows however long. <laughs> cool. I like that. Yeah. And the reason I ask is, what do you think the importance of brand is, right? Mm -hmm. Like brand personal brand company brand whatever brand you want to talk about um 
What do you think the importance of that is in providing a service, a company building mm -hmm. up an image? Mm -hmm. Because you consciously went through a redesign. You, I think you also upped your, uh, redesigned your website Recently. as well. Yeah. And so how much of a role does that play into your brand life cycle and you like qualifying and closing clients? Yeah, so I think it kind of goes back mm. to which side of the aisle I sit on, right? So for me, my brand has always been Sarah tattoos. She's a badass. She, you know, like I didn't put those claims on me, but I will take them. I'm happy. Um, but I felt very much like the brand was me and not a business. And I don't really know how to explain that, but I also feel like there's this narrative where like, if you are a female freelancer, like you have to have these like pictures of working on your iPad and like smiling and skipping through the flowers. Like that's not what business, that's not a business, that's a hobby. And from the beginning, I wanted to separate myself from that. And I'm not trying to be an asshole. I'm not like against the girls, but like, I don't want to play that game. I want to play the big dog game. I want to be in the room with the big dogs and not be questioned why I'm there. And so something you just brought up that we went through a rebrand recently when we did the trademark filing is that um, I was getting very high caliber clients. And when new high caliber clients were coming, the connection was not there because my brand was very much like edgy and skateboards and you know shit that I love but it didn't speak to who we were working with and so we took that conscious effort to say hey like where do we want to be in 10 years do we want to be the pentagram of operations do we want to be landing 100k clients or do we want to stay in the $2,500 little invoice game which is fine to an extent but I have a team now like I don't I don't want to be struggling to say like, oh, we didn't convert that client because we didn't show up professionally, you know? Um, and I think at the end of the day, like I also no longer want to be the face of the brand because it's a company, it's yeah. not a brand. And I think there's a very clear defining difference there. Um, I'm the face of my YouTube channel. I'm the face of my social media, obviously, but I also treat myself like I'm replaceable, which I think a lot of people don't do in their business. They think, oh, well, it's just me. Like if I shut it down, I shut it down, right? It's like, I mean, you could sell, you could have, you could step away and own the business, but have someone doing strategy, doing sales, whatever. And that was, I wanted to have that as an option without having to do the work later. I wanted that to kind of just show up one day if and when we get there without it being a struggle. The reason I think that's important and why I'm asking is a lot of folks earlier in their journey, mm -hmm. should they focus on brand or should they focus on getting clients and providing value? Because mm -hmm. I feel like people tend to add reasons to push something off. Like, mm -hmm. oh, let me do this. I'll do it after I do that. I'll do it. I need a brand. I need a brand before I do this. Yeah. And I think it has its place, mm -hmm. but it also, there, there's a right time to then focus on a brand and a rebrand and a positioning. Mm -hmm. Because if you haven't put the reps in, you don't know what you want to do. Exactly. You don't know what you like, what you don't like. So you're pre-investing mm -hmm. in a brand that may not even be what you want it to be. Yeah. And so I think that's an important distinction to at least understand mm -hmm. before you go into it. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, if you look at my career, right? Like I didn't have a website for the first, I think, eight or nine months of freelancing. But I also pivoted so much. I did 12 different things. I'm not going to rebuild a website 12 different times. Like I've, I've refused to do that. Yeah. <laughs> that just sounds so exhausting. Um, but I think the other thing is like when you are first starting out, people are hiring you, your brand doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I do think outside of that, you have to do the internal work to start building that momentum. And so one thing that I did very early on, I still do it every six months or so is I do what I call a skills list where I sit down and, and, now I've had so many iterations, I just build off of the last one, but you gotta start somewhere. So you literally sit and you write down every single skill that you have. And then you basically do like a pro con list in a way of what are the skills that I want nothing to do with anymore? What are the skills that I am kind of good at and I want to explore more, but they're not gonna make or break me. But then what are the skills that I know I can make money on? And I feel like, so, I literally had this conversation on Friday where I feel like so many freelancers, when they decide to jump ship at their job, they're like, I have no skill set. I know nothing, I, you know? And it's like, no, no, no. Like we can carry things forward 
and you can survive off of whatever you were cruising on before and then allow that to transition you into something else and quote unquote pivot as people call, say that I do all the time. It's like, no, I'm just looking at the data and going, oh, this isn't making me money, but this is, you may not have seen that publicly, but it doesn't mean I haven't been working on it this whole time, you know? And I think that's, that's what you need to do first before you're like, oh, what's my logo? You know, I need headshots. Like who cares? Use your work headshot. No one cares. Like, you know, it doesn't matter. None of that matters. It really doesn't. I feel like social media has trained me to now I'm trying not to do this, but mm -hmm. every time I'm in the podcast, when someone says something, I'm like, oh, that's a good clip. Mm -hmm. That's a good short. And I was just thinking with the system you're talking about, mm -hmm. that would be a good, like a five minute video for you to do on yeah. like how you do this. Mm -hmm. Even though you don't, freelancers aren't your client, mm -hmm. but it's just an interesting way that people will see like, oh, maybe I should go use that framework and yeah. whatever. Yeah, um, definitely. I've actually but, taught workshops on that plus like process auditing. Okay, nice. So yeah, anytime I do live, I'm like, audit your skills. You are replaceable. <laughs> yeah. But no one wants to hear that. You know, no one wants to be like, oh my God, I'll never have my business. It's like, yeah, you won't. Like you shouldn't have the business you started out with five years ago. Like yeah. if you're not evolving, then why are you here? 100%. That's the whole point of entrepreneurship is to evolve and grow and change. But I digress. <laughs> so talking about Notion, sure. you found Notion at some point in the journey. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the exact saying is, but I've heard a lot of people say, you know, be a barnacle on a whale. Mm -hmm. And was that part of the thinking or mm -hmm. when you found Notion, became a certified expert mm -hmm. and then there are a bunch of other tools you're affiliated with? Was that intentional? Did it just happen because you were using them or yeah. what was that journey? Sure. So I was a massive Trello user, actually. Okay. I lived and breathed and died by Taco the Dog. I love Trello, but then I interviewed with them and I did five in-person interviews and they ghosted me and I was like, mm, that's gross. Um, and so I literally, you know, when I started freelancing, Trello worked. Trello worked for undergrad. It worked for my day job. And then I started freelancing and it didn't work anymore. And I was consistently missing things, right? Because I, like, my neurodivergency, I don't remember to, like, do the shortcuts, you know? Like, I would not remember to click into a board and see progress and catch up with things. I'm not good at, like, daily or weekly reviews. Like, that's just, like, not me at all. And, um, and so... I literally Googled project management tools and this was late. Yeah. I had like just started freelancing. So it was like late 2018. Cause I freelanced for, you know, odd and on. And then, you know, the six months was like really freelancing. Um, in that time, I literally Googled project management tools and notion was the, was the ad at the top of the search. And I was like, what's notion. And, um, I opened it up and I was like, Whoa, like this is cool. Right. Like, Oh, it's, I can build it however I want. I think I found it on like a Saturday morning. And by Sunday night I was in notion full time, like had built my boards and my dashboards and my client portals. And, um, and yeah, and I put out a video about using notion to run my design agency again, was one of the first people on YouTube to talk about it, just like I did with AmeriCorps. And that video blew up. It still makes me about 30 grand a year from that video. And it's like me sitting in a dark black room with my ring light. Like it is not good production. Like it's just, oh my God, I look back and I'm like, this is embarrassing. The fact that it still makes me client revenue is embarrassing. <laughs> Um, but Does yeah, it make so, you 30 grand in AdSense or? No, no, no. In like, like people lead. finding okay. the video and then hiring me. Nice. Like no ad, no rev, like no sponsor, nothing. No affiliates, nothing. Like pure client one-on-one -on -one service revenue. And um, and so yeah, I put that video out and I think it's, I think it's only at like 30, 30,000 views right now. Like it's not like this like it's mega viewed. Though. Yeah. And, um, and so that had kind of blown up. And I had my first Notion client from that video was a design agency out in the Bay. They basically do like um, seating kits for like the Lakers and, you know, all these different like Dick's Sporting Goods, right? Um, so they hired me. I then built a Notion template bundle called Notion for Designers. And because um, I had another I had another client reach out and they were like, please build my notion. I was like, I'm good. Um, that actually happened first. Sorry, my timelines are all off. So this woman from Ireland reached out to me like eight times. She's like, please build my notion. And I was like, mm, 
I make logos. Like, I don't know. Um, and she finally convinced me. I charged her $450 to build her Notion account out. And I was like, oh, but like Notion kind of has this template gallery. Like, okay, like I'll, if you're asking for it around the world, like I'm sure other people are. So I turned it into templates, started selling those. And that's when I got my first Notion, like real clients, they bought the template bundle and then hired me. And I was like, oh, that's a funnel, right? So I quickly built this email funnel where people would buy the $47 template. And three days later, I'd go, oh, is Notion too hard for you? Like hire me and I'll customize it. I'll move all your data. That's what I was selling was data migration at the very beginning, not custom dashboards. I was literally selling data migration from HoneyBook, from Trello, from, you know, Monday Asana, whatever. And I did, I had 4,000 people, give or take, download it. And that was my first full year on Notion was literally that one email funnel was selling like hotcakes. Um, and Notion came to me that November. I think I sold that for like six months. Notion came to me and they were like, hey, we have this certification, it's free. Do you wanna go through it? And I'm like, what do I have to lose? Also was leaving design at the time. So all of this is like very gray area, right? I was still designing full time, doing these Notion things. I'd had a celebrity client I worked with in design who took me to court, who had sued me. Um, and I was like, oh, well, I'll just do the certification. Like, I don't want to design anymore. Like, I can't do the emotion. I'm, I'm over it. I'm shutting all this down. And that was February of 22. Yeah, I was officially certified in February 2022. 10th US certified Notion consultant, 40th in the world. And there's 58 of us now. So, yeah. And so when I got that, I was like, cool, I'm out. I'm not designing anymore. Like, I'm just going to ride this Notion wave, you know, like clearly something's working. Um, but yeah, it, it kind of just fell into my lap. I don't know. I don't know. So a couple quick questions. So you said you sold your template for $47, mm -hmm. right? Does that, do you still sell that? No. That, okay. No. So that was actually one of the pivots. People were not happy that I made. Um, so I had so many people buying that template. But I kept getting the same feedback over and over again. This is great, but there's so much in here. I don't need X. I don't need Y. I don't need Z. I don't think I'm ever going to need that stuff. It might complete with every template I've ever bought. Yeah. But. And so I was like, oh, well, what if I just dismantle the whole thing and just sell pieces, a library? No, no, no. Just a library okay. of everything that was in there and basically sell it as like a plug and play. Like, so I built this massive, um, database library in notion and what i did was like for instance i would do um like a crm template oh well it pairs with the proposal template to send proposal and so i would just basically relation the templates yeah. back to each other and say well this one works well with this and this is why it works well and i did video like video trainings on half of them i included my notion basics course and that was five times more successful than the original bundle. Um, but Can I didn't you say wanna... roughly how much the original bundle made? Okay, so all in buy plus one-on-one, -on -one, I did about 120,000 just on that. Um, and then, because I had a couple clients who like had bought it, but then wanted like a fully built okay. Notion account. So like a $47, I think I had six clients turn into like a 5K client okay. um, but I was mainly selling that $1,500 upsell and that was like a no-brainer to people I was like oh okay. so just to break it down <laughs> for folks listening you're yeah. selling a $47 template mm -hmm. roughly how much time did it take you to make that well, I did it with that first client. Okay, so so you're literally this woman from Ireland, she owns an illustration company. And she was like, okay, these are like the five things I want. And I just literally, I built it for her. I got feedback and then I hit duplicate. Mm -hmm. And then I just like kind of cleaned it up a bit. So, yeah. you know, like generalized it. Yeah, yeah. generalized it. Um, did like a quick video, like okay. a loom video nice. of how to use it. So I don't know, maybe yeah. a weekend. So what I'm trying to get at <laughs> is just trying to highlight that not everything needs full production and like 18 yes. weeks of like planning. Right. And so like you turned a paid gig with a weekend's work of work into a $4,700 template mm -hmm. that you sold roughly 80, 90 grand worth of. Mm -hmm. That's technically free passive money. Yeah. Like you're not, yeah. you weren't actively selling marketing funnel mm -hmm. ads. There was nothing you I were doing. I gave it, after I built it, I gave it to 10 designers for free. And I was in this like Slack designer community and yeah. I was like, hey, like no one's really knowing about Notion yet. Like 
Notion was not on the map. Like yeah. I very much, I'm not ego driven. I'm not a narcissist, but I definitely know that I played a huge role in putting Notion on the map in the creator space. Like the, it was insane the way that people were eating this template up. I mean, it, like Eastlow didn't exist yet. I mean, he did, but like not in the Notion sphere, you know? Um, yeah, I gave it to 10 people and I was like, hey, give me feedback on this. And it literally, I never marketed it. I never even made content on it. Never talked about it, never posted it. I think I maybe posted one testimonial like eight months after I'd already been selling it. Like it just worked. I don't know. And I think that's like message. It's like lightning in a bottle almost like because people ask me all the time, like I want to be a Notion creator. I'm like, I don't think you can do that anymore. The way that me, Thomas, Frank and a couple other people did it in 2019, 2020. So, I mean, I think you could, but like, I don't think you can yeah. unless you're growth hacking. And even that, there's no value in that. So, and so, what I'm trying to get at is, <laughs> you converted that into mm -hmm. five figure revenue, and then you figured out an email funnel to then convert people into mm -hmm. individual clients, right? And so, roughly, you made 120k off of this. Mm -hmm. But then, once you broke it down and you sold the mm -hmm. um, relational packages, yeah. What, what was that effort versus how much did you roughly make from mm -hmm. that? So that was a subscription. Um, so that was like, oh, I'm going to do a subscription product. It was just stupid. Um, I don't know. We got to try it out to know that. Yeah. I don't know how much I made off of it, but I was charging $247 for the year. Okay. Um, and I did not let anyone renew because okay. it, I was at a point where like, my client work was getting so popular that I was like, I don't have time to update these little tiny templates when Notion decides to release another feature. You know, like if y'all are in the Notion sphere, like Notion is constantly rolling things out. And I have access to everything like three months before it drops. Like I don't have time to be tracking like, oh, fuck, am I accidentally showing something in a video? Like and I did. And that was one of the issues of why I took it down. So. Notion was going to be releasing this feature that I didn't get in trouble, but I was like, this is why I shut it down. Which is the feature if it's launched? It's not launched, okay. which is why I have to be mindful of what I say right now. Um, they were launching a feature that we all on a weekly basis are like still dreaming about this. We wish that you guys would launch this, um, but there are better things coming in the next like quarter, which I think people will be very excited about. Um, but yeah, so I had gone through and did like a video overview of this library and I had built it using this feature because we were all told it's gonna launch on X date. And so I was like, oh, well, I'll just wait to launch this thing so I can include the new feature and put it out, not really thinking that it was in the overview video and it got called out. And at that point I was like, I can't keep building templates because I am too paranoid that I am going to screw up my NDA and like accidentally show more than I did. Like I could take a video down and re record. It's not that big of a deal, but I was just like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And so I think I had in that time frame 600 people download it at the 247 nice. mark. So whatever that looks like. But that didn't convert as well into clients as the other one did, um, which was okay because at that point then I was already doing about 10K in Notion build. So I was like, I don't really care about these templates. Like I just don't. I was using them as foundation for a lot of clients on the lower end. So it was still working, you know? It was kind of like, oh, I'll fix this problem. But like, I don't really care about fixing the problem. I'm just reacting to data. And that was one of the times where I was like, mm, I probably didn't need to do that, you know? So it's fine. <laughs> and so along with Notion, so yeah. you're certified, you're getting leads. You've never had to market. You have a brand mm -hmm. around Notion building and you have reputation there, right? Yeah. What are other tools that you started mm -hmm. picking up and certifying on? And is it because you found them early enough or you just mm -hmm. use them and like them? Or how are you picking tools to associate yourself with sure. because it's also branding and visibility and yeah. marketing for you. Yeah, I mean, I will say I'm grateful for Notion. It's a good SEO driver, but I'm very much, you know, if we are going to build this business, we can't be reliant on one tool. Yeah. We just hit 100 million users on Notion. But also, let me clarify, I am not a Notion employee. <laughs> in case anyone, <laughs> in case it's not clear, Notion does not pay me uh, for anything. Um, 
But, you know, I'm also a pessimist. If they shut down tomorrow and I've built this entire brand on one platform, I have nothing and I'm going to have to start from zero, which sounds exhausting to me. Um, and so I have always been a huge champion of my of the tools that I personally use. Right. And how do I build a relationship with those tools instead of seeking out like blank tools that I've never used? So a great example, I've used paper form since I've started freelancing. I found them again on a Google search. I need a form tool. I hated type form. I hate that it's that their UI is only one question at a time. And like my brain, I'm like, this works so slow. Like I should be able to answer the next question as I'm typing in the previous one. That's just how my brain works. And I also um, feel like it's too expensive. It's also extremely expensive. Their web hooks are trash. Their API is not good. I, Anyway, I'm not I'm not a fan of type form. Um, and so I Google type form sponsor me. No. Um, give me an affiliate though. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I Googled form tools and paper form had come up. I was like, oh, what's paper form? And it was one of the first tools I actually paid for in my business. So I've been with them since my design days. And I got really close with their team. I did a couple of videos with them. I'm like one of BFFs with their marketing team to this day. Like shout out love them um and so they were developing a certification and came to me and they're like hey do you want to go through this and like give us feedback and i'm like yeah sure so i'm their first certified global expert for nice. paper form um and that set the tone i was like cool i've got notion i've got paper form like those are the like key tools um and then i got into cal.com because calendly kind of fucked me over on some partnership stuff and um i was like jumping ship there and found cal i'm really good friends with their founder and um yeah, it just kind of like, I was like, okay, what's the next box to check? What's the next, you know, you kind of have like a list of your tech stack, right? Like what belongs in your ecosystem? Finance, accounting, invoices, whatever, right? Like, and you've got to fill that box. And so I have now since started networking with the tools that I'm not an expert in and saying, hey, like I'm consistently putting clients on. I don't need an affiliate at this point. I want a partnership with y'all. And so I have a couple of contracts now where I'm on retainer for 10-ish hours a week and their customer support team, if they have a new user who needs like outside of like how do I do X, right? That you can just like use an AI to answer from the from the wiki, they will ship that client to me to do setup, to do nice. training. And then I just bill that brand for the time and they pay me, the client, the nice. new user doesn't. Um, and that's been a pretty nice new model for nice. me. Um, but I'm also very picky and cheesy. So like a great example, South by last year, I went to a HoneyBook event. Do you know how many people I move off of HoneyBook? I mean, every solo partner, I don't even know what HoneyBook is. Oh, okay, so HoneyBook is an all-in-one tool so Notion is not an all-in-one, right? You can't do invoices, yeah, yeah. you can't do contracts. Well, you can do contracts, but, but anyway. Yeah. So HoneyBook was built for photographers, specifically wedding photographers. And they have a sales pipeline. You can send, they call them brochures, they're proposals. Um, you can do contracts, you can send invoicing. You cannot do accounting though. So that's a very clear line. And literally almost every single solopreneur that I work with to this day, I'm moving off of HoneyBook because they're like, this is too bulky. It's too, like the too UI is too, yeah. But they're also like not utilizing all the features. So anyways, go to the South by event and it's for HoneyBook. And I'm like, I feel really awkward being here, but like they, you know, like it's always good to network, right? And they were like, we have to get you to be a HoneyBook expert. And I was like, I think that's, a, that's like controversial. You know, like a hypocritical because I don't put people on handbook. I take them off. And we ended up doing a think tank and I gave them all of this feedback. So I was like, I don't always want to be moving people off a platform. I So now my focus is we don't need to rip band-aids. We need to literally see what tools are inside the tool are you not using? What features do you not know about? Let's try to maximize there and then we can move you to something else. And so I think to circle back, you know, the biggest misconception is all I do is Notion. Yeah. It's like 20% of my projects, yeah. you know, like I'm doing Slack enterprise, I'm doing Google workspace builds, I'm setting up calendar booking. Like I rarely look at Notion now. And I think it's because I've built an entire ecosystem of knowledge um, that really, you know, you just have to like kind of ride the wave and decide, oh, is this good for me? Is it not? Yeah. You know, so, but also like if a client is adamant about being on a tool that I'm not an expert, on, I'm not going to be like, no, no you yeah. can't use it. It's like, okay, well tell me why. Like, why do you like yeah. this? So, because then for me, it's research. Makes sense. You know, so. 
Sweet. Yeah. Um, last question before we go into the rapid fire part. But you've done a couple of different pricing models. Yeah. Across. So how did you keep pivoting and what, mm -hmm. what are you falling on in terms of what you like? Yeah. So I think for me, the pivot was custom writing custom proposals was not landing me more clients than not writing custom proposals. I think that there's a time and place for that. So a great example, landed a celebrity client at the beginning of the year. It took me five months to land this contract. It was the most custom written proposal I'd ever done in my life because of the nitty gritty and in finer details it needed to be fine with that. It was also my largest invoice I've ever written. Um, but on the day to day, like I have had so many clients at this point. I think I've in systems we've worked with at least 175 clients at this point. Um, and so I know like I'm very good. I don't want to say gut, but like if you came to me and you gave me like three sentences of what you needed, I would be able to come up with eight more sentences of what you didn't know you needed, but we're going to accomplish in this project. So for me, it makes sense to just charge and auto include all of that. And so that's what I do. I don't do productized the way that it's being marketed because that is not productized. That's subscription. Whole nother conversation. Go watch that video on my YouTube channel because I lay it all out. Um, but what I do is I have set internal rates where I know, okay, these are the parameters. This is what I will, I know I'm still gonna profit. Even if they ask me for five more things, I'm still gonna profit off of it. So how I, how I do that is I have flat rate. That's my, I don't go under. And then I add a year, every year for experience. So for me, I've been doing ops for seven years now, right? Cause you gotta count the skill points up, skills matter. And then now, and so, my notion builds are 7,500, but that also includes customer journey mapping. It also includes integrations to your other tools. It also includes data migration. It also includes training live and recorded for your team. Um, but then, so that's the base number. But then if you are, let's say, um, how do I, what are my team numbers now? So if you're t 10 and under, it's 7,500. If you are 11 to 50, it's a little bit more expensive. 51 to 100 is a little more expensive. And then what I consider enterprise is 150 and up. And that's, um, well, that is a completely different model. So enterprise is always about nine months to a year contract with me because I'm meeting with every department. Yeah. There's so much red tape there. Um, but I also am moving into a exclusivity model. So if you are enterprise, you're paying for exclusivity. I don't work with anybody else during that time. Um, and if I do, it's like not even remotely close to that stuff. Um, and then um, I'm also playing around with the idea of equity and just being a longstanding COO. So you have this flat rate, which is basically like a year salary for me. And then if you want to keep me on, I you, take advisory equity, shares or advisory whatever. shares, or I'm helping you hire a COO slash CTO because there's a lot of gray area there. Um, and then I'm offboarding all of that. So, nice. yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a couple of questions I like asking towards the end. Sure. What's your startup tech stack and how do you run your company? And like go through like yeah. which tool for what? Yeah, yeah. So we run a very tight ship. Um, so I have two assistants. Um, I have a projects assistant who does a lot of the foundational implementation. So I still do strategy, client management, client communication, um, quality control, training. They do a lot of like, oh, if you need cal.com set up, we're gonna go create that for you. If you need, um, like if we're doing a Notion build, we have our own internal stack that they duplicate and set up. Very foundational. So um, also Sebastian's like going back to school for data science, like he's very part-time now at this point, which makes me sad. Um, and then I have someone solely managing my calendar. So Alexa has been a godsend um, because as you know, as one of my friends, I have 12 million things going on that we didn't even talk about half of them. Um, and so I sit with Alexa for like an hour every week and I'm like, look, this is a project I wanna work on find time in my calendar, right? She also audits my time to say, hey, you're spending too much time on this or not enough time on that. And she helps me plug my time. Um, so we, the three of us, 
fully operate on Slack. We do not use anything else. Um, we have fully embraced a system that I have built inside Slack that just works for all of our brains. Um, we use Slack huddles, we use Slack voice notes, like we are fully invested in Slack. Um, are you using the Slack list tool? Yeah, you know, we've been beta testing it. I don't love them. I think that there are some crucial things that they, they should implement into it to really make them good, but they're not trash. That, that I'm okay. just gonna leave it yeah. at that. Still, obviously, Google Workspace. We use email. I don't really use Google Drive. I do sometimes, but it's more like people sharing stuff with me and opening it. Um, so that's email. Uh, calendar booking. We use cal.com. Stripe for invoicing. Um, invoicing any like little odd and end things I sell, we put through there. Um, I use Notion for my sales pipeline. I do all of my accounting actually in in um, Notion now because it's just way easier. I track my affiliate payments, I track invoices, all that good stuff. Sales pipeline. I also am launching um, a subscription resource hub here in about a month. Um, and so, like, I track all of my like lead gen from my free workbook to get them to convert. All the all the templates, everything live in Notion. Um, what else do we use? Paper form for all of our forms, our contracts, slash paper sign. Paper sign is um, one of their internal tools where you can custom write a contract and, and like send it to each signer. We use that sparingly. That's more for like our enterprise clients that want like a, a real contract, um, custom contract. Um, fuck, what else do we use? Canva. That's, oh, so our website's on Squarespace. Okay. That's like it. Oh, uh, Miro. So I'm also a Miro consultant. Shouldn't have forgot that one. Uh, Miro's whiteboarding. So we use that with every client. Um, Tella if I need to video record. And that's pretty much it. Okay. I think. Yeah. I can follow up. But I, we run a very tight ship. Like I don't, I don't have a social scheduling tool. I don't have... I mean, I use Final Cut, but like that's not the business. That's like my own content. You know, I use Restream when I live stream. <laughs> part of me wants to I reach out know. to part of me wants to reach out to every Jew and be like sponsor. sponsor. Seriously. I mean, seriously, like the thing about paper form, it's so funny. I always have such sponsor. a bone to pick because I'm like, I have not paid for paper form for like three years because my affiliate is so good. I'm like, just pay me differently like pay me for leads now because i'm not i'm not benefiting like i get the emails and it's like oh you know woohoo you put a friend on there i'm like great like i don't get anything for it <laughs> you know but oh well it's fine what are three resources that you'd recommend to folks starting out their business freelance mm -hmm. their journey um, so actually I will plug my website. So I have a lead magnet. It's called the business ecosystem workbook. If you go to the top of my website, click learn, and then it's literally the workbook. We'll, we'll plug a little Yeah, link. yeah, yeah. Um, that Fake image hover here. It, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that I have transformed more than 300 companies with that doc. Um, it will ask you everything from like, what is your customer journey? Who's in charge of sales? Do you do you know how many people don't collect feedback at the end of their projects? Like, build a funnel. Why, don't even do it manually. Like, just build it and don't think about it. You know, so it asks you all of that. And there's actually two versions in there. There's one for solo people. And I call solo people, you really are a team of one or you have like a contractor yeah. or two, right? Like, I say we, but like technically I am a team of one full time. Um, there's also a version for teams in there. So that's really good. Um, I also would 100% recommend writing out your processes. And I'm not saying like you have to write these elaborate SOPs, but literally if somebody reaches out to you, what do you do? How do you respond? Are you giving them a calendar booking link? Are you going back and forth in email to find availability? And then literally looking at that and saying, okay, how can I make this better? How can I translate that? Do it every 90 days. Um, and actually I'll post all these resources too. I've been meaning to like make them public, but I also, so I have a, pro I have a process audit guide. Exclusive. So, no, <laughs> I give them away for free all the time. Every conference I speak at, like I'm like, take my resources. The other one is a client review guide. This has been life changing for me. I give it to everybody after every single project you need to be reviewing it. So looking at what were the red flags? What were the green flags? What did you learn? What, I think one thing I, you know, helped me with this is that I had somebody very good hearted, bless their soul, 
uh, bless their heart, whatever. Um, and they kept referring clients to me and they were not good referrals. And so being able to track, oh, yeah, they're giving me a lot of business, but it's actually not the work I want to be doing. I either need to tell them, hey, this is the work I'm doing now, or just say, hey, thanks, and just automatically decline those projects. Um, so I do that still to this day after nice. every single project. And then I take all of those every 90 days and I say, okay, what needs to change about the process? What needs to be improved? Or am I just like going off emotion because this project wasn't good? I can ignore it because I feel better, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's what I would recommend the, okay. for the three. Mm. We'll link everything. Yeah, definitely. And I do this bit where I ask a previous guest for a question for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your question is, what is the most interesting thing that you recently learned that surprised Ooh. you? Oh, God. I'm really bad at learning. Um, one thing I learned that surprised me. I hate, you should have told me this earlier so I could think about this this whole time. Um, Just add tense music at this point. No, but Focus like seriously, I am so stressed out right now. Um, so I am a huge cook like honestly i joke all the time that if my business were to shut down or fail i'd go to culinary school like i we've, we've talked about this yeah. i love it um i will say <laughs> okay i have two thoughts so um the first is i just listened uh back I, anthony bourdain is one of my favorite humans yeah. i that is one death that will never be okay with me. And I just re-listened to his episode that he did with Joe Rogan back in like two. I'm a huge Joe Rogan fan. Love Rogan. I do not care. I hope you don't lose views for me saying that. Um, but he was on Rogan back in 2011 and he was just talking about different dynamics with food and like how cultures like if you are coming in people will literally just like slaughter a lamb just to like celebrate you coming into the space. And I, I think being white we don't have culture like that where it's like oh i'm gonna like cook you this elaborate meal yeah. because you are are coming and visiting um and so hearing how his dynamics were in different cities in different countries is really fascinating um i will not share the second one that come to mind because it's not appropriate um, we'll cut it out that's fine okay i'll tell you so we saw rogan last week which he did his whole set and then he was live on netflix yeah, yeah, yeah. and he was in his set talking about his time on Fear Factor because he hosted Fear Factor and how the last thing he ever filmed was making people drink donkey cum. And in his set, he tells you how you do it. And I was I, I wouldn't know how you stick a prong up a donkey and get them. Anyway, um, that's literally what came to mind. I was like, I can't say that. I don't think that bit made it to Netflix. No, it did. Oh, it I, 100% I, Okay, I didn't did. see the whole thing yet. But like... I didn't need to learn that. <laughs> I did not need to learn that, but here we are. So yeah. cool. Um, I I'm, probably I'm just should thinking, learn more business things. That's fine. <laughs> um, I'm just thinking if we can add a graphic of that. But I mean, you could probably do the clip from him saying it uh, from Netflix. I don't know. Um, what's your question for my next guest? My next question would be: Outside of your industry, who do you find inspiration from? Or what do you, you know, like, who do you, f who do you look towards as a mentor? So like for me, I don't follow anyone in business. Yeah. I really don't. Like I am such a foodie. Like I am following, like I'm obsessed with barbecue. I'm constantly learning from barbecue shops. Like how do you run your business? What, what are you doing to stay lean and, and provide good product? Yeah. Um, following chefs and you know that's that's how i learn about business so i think it'd be really fascinating nice. to hear how what people learn from outside of their normal space nice yeah sweet yeah. well that's all i had for you thank okay. you for coming on yeah thanks for having what me. do you want to plug again well, <laughs> two plugs in an episode now. Plug our coffee. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, I just, you know, I tell everybody i'm an open book, you know It's me running my social media. I don't have help. So like ask me like have conversations with me if there's stuff from today where you're like that didn't make sense or i want to marinate on that more like i am so openly transparent like i will answer anything um so like let's chat let's talk and that's that's the only plug and if we vibe great subscribe <laughs> <laughs> well thank you thanks for coming on and yeah um we'll do an episode too definitely sounds good thanks